Christian Church. Uh, today's Bible reading is from Book of Revelation, chapter 6, verse 1, to uh, chapter 7, verse 10. Uh, it's also on the screen. Um, let's start our reading. Revelation, chapter 6, starting from verse 1. I watched as the Lamb opened the first of the seven seals, Then I heard one of the four living creatures say in a voice like thunder, Come. I looked, and there before me was a white horse. Its rider held a bow, and he was given a crown, and he rode out as a conqueror, bent on the conquest. Bent on conquest. When the lamb opened the second seal, I heard the second living creature say, Come. Then another horse came out. A fiery red one, its rider was given power to take peace from the earth and make men slay each other. To him was given a large sword. When the lamb opened the third seal, I heard the third living creature say, Come. I looked, and there before me was a black horse. Its rider was holding a pair of scales in his hand. Then I heard what sounded like a voice among the four living creatures saying, a quart of wheat for a day's wages, and three quarts of barley for a day's wages, and do not damage the oil and the wine. When the lamb opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth living creature say, Come. I looked, and there before me was a pale horse. Its rider was named Death, and Hades, and Hades was following close behind him. They were given power over a fourth of the earth to kill by sword, famine and plague, and by the wild beasts of the earth. When he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the order the souls of those who had been slain because of the word of God and the testimony they had maintained. They called out in a loud voice, How long, sovereign Lord, holy and true, until you judge the inhabitant of the earth, and avenge our blood. Then each of them was given a white robe, and they were told to wait a little longer until the number of their fellow servants and brothers who were to be killed as they had been was completed. I watched as he opened the sixth seal. There was a great earthquake. The sun turned black like sackcloth made of gold hair. The whole moon turned blood red, and the stars in the sky fell to earth as late fig dropped from fig tree when shaken by a strong wind. The sky receded like a scroll, rolling up, and every mountain and island was removed from its place. Then the king of the earth, the princes, the generals, the rich, the mighty, and every slave and every free man hid in caves and among the rocks of the mountains. They called to the mountains and the rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of their wrath has come, and who can stand? After this, I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding back the four winds of the earth to prevent any wind from blowing on the land or on sea, on the sea or on any tree. Then I saw another angel coming up from the east, having the seal of the living God. He called out in a loud voice to the four angels who had been given power to harm the land and the sea. Do not harm the land or the sea or the trees, until we put a seal on the foreheads of the servants of our God. Then I heard the number of those who were sealed, 144,000 from all the tribes of Israel. From the tribes of Judah, 12,000 were sealed. From the tribe of Reuben, 12,000. From the tribe of Gad, 12,000. From the tribe of Asher, 12,000. From the tribe of Naphtali, 12,000. From the tribe of Manasseh, 12,000. From the tribe of Simeon, 12,000. From the tribe of Levi, 
twelve thousand. From the tribe of Issachar, twelve thousand. From the tribe of Zebulun, twelve thousand. From the tribe of Joseph, twelve thousand. From the tribe of Benjamin, twelve thousand. After this, I looked, and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count, from every nation, tribe, people, and language, standing before the throne and in front of the Lamb. They were wearing white robes and were holding palm branches in their hands, and they cried out in a loud voice, "Salvation belongs to our God, who sits on the throne, and to the Lamb." This is the reading today. Well, thank you again for allowing me to be able to speak today from God's Word and also to be able to talk about ECM and our work in Europe. Let me pray as we start. Heavenly Father, we give you great thanks for your word to us. Help us to not see it as merely a human word, but as your word and as your power for salvation. Help us, Lord, to be able to interact with it, to listen and to internalise so that our lives might be changed, that your true word might be at work in us Uh, and produce fruit in us for now and then for all eternity. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So I want to talk today about vision. Organisations spend a lot of time talking about vision these days. It seems like every organisation, in fact every person, seems to have a vision. We talk about vision a lot. And perhaps there's a temptation to think, Uh, the word is overused, it's overrated. Seems like you can't even go to your local burger outlet without being exposed to a vision statement. But the reality is that we need vision. Vision is having a clear clear mental picture in our mind of where we're going and so crystallising the steps we need to take in order to get to where we should be going. Even to do something just out of the ordinary, For instance, if today you decided that you wanted to go to a new shopping centre, you would have to think about where and when and the people that you wanted and then you would mobilise in order to get there. Silly example, but most organisations, when you think about an organisation working together, have to think through this very carefully. Even churches, where are we headed? And so, therefore, what are the steps that we need to be taking to get there? As some organisations say, we need to start with the end in mind. You start with the end in mind. What are we all trying to achieve out of all of this together? And you know, God works like that as well. When he made the heavens and the earth, he started with the end in mind. He knew exactly what he was trying to achieve in all of this and he as God can achieve it. To those who are a little bit cynical about all this talk about vision, Did you know that the Bible ends with a vision statement? So God is into vision. As we look at these key verses today that we had read, we see that the book of Revelation is about vision. It's a series of visions that things must take place now that Jesus has completed his earthly mission. He's come to earth, he's lived the perfect life, he's died in our place, he's risen, he's now ascended into heaven And there are certain set of things that now must take place. That's what Revelation is all about. Another word for vision in the Bible is hope. Hope. Hope is not some vague, distant wish in the Bible. In fact, it's all about the guaranteed future which we await. The guaranteed future for God's people. And hope is often expressed in visions Uh, like in the book of Revelation, prophecies and other things like that, which help us to be inspired but also give tangible reality to what is our hope. John writes at a time where he himself needed a vision of the glorious future to come 
And he writes to seven churches at a time that, where they were under pressure. He said there was persecution going on at the time. They were being shaken. You see, Christians at the time when John is writing didn't fit into their society. They weren't counted by then as true Jews and so weren't given licence to practise their religion. But also they weren't good subjects of the Roman Empire because they refused, refused to bow the knee to Caesar. When in the middle of the night your sister or brother or father or best friend gets dragged off to be imprisoned and possibly tortured, you can imagine at that point you start questioning whether this is all worth it. And you need to have a firm idea of what your hope is. We need vision as well, you know, because we may not necessarily face the same level of persecution that we see here in the book of Revelation. But we are under pressure. We won't fit in. If we're faithful followers of Jesus, we won't fit in to our society. We'll find it difficult. But, you know, I don't even think that our biggest problem is persecution or that it's becoming increasingly difficult to fit into our society and be a faithful follower of Jesus. I think our biggest problem is losing perspective. It's losing sight of that big, glorious picture of the end when God puts everything right. And to be comfortable here on earth, to live a fairly comfortable Christianity and to think that in the end my life should revolve around my little achievements, my little goals, my little comforts and that there's nothing more. That, friends, is a pale reflection of who we're meant to be as believers. So I want to talk today about vision, why we need vision, which is what I've just talked about. And now, as we go to our second point, what specifically that vision is and then thirdly, how God achieves his vision and our part to play. What is God's vision? Well, it revolves around a little lamb but I'll get to that in a second. I want to start off by sharing in Eastern Europe before the fall of the communist regime, the fall of the Berlin Wall, what it would have been like to be a Christian in those times. European Christian Mission had its origin in that part of the world, our focus in that part of the world. So one of our international leaders, Stuart Harris, worked with Richard Wormbrandt who wrote Tortured for Christ, uh, which recounted his terrible sufferings under the communist regime in Romania. You know, at the time, it was very, very difficult to be a Christian. It's hard for us to imagine. There's so many of the things that we take for granted they couldn't do. They were discriminated and persecuted at every level, even to the point that they weren't allowed to go to university if they were known to be a Christian and couldn't be a part of any professional societies. The only jobs that were available to them were menial jobs. They certainly couldn't legally meet for church and everything around that. But when communism fell, things changed dramatically and they could start putting up signs of when church was on. One church in Prague, in then Czechoslovakia, now Czech Republic, put up a sign and it read, the lamb wins. The lamb wins. What does that mean, the lamb wins? I mean, for most people, a lamb is innocuous, insignificant, cute. What is it all about, this the lamb wins? Well, I think in their context, they were saying something very significant that the communist regime thought of Christianity and Jesus as a little lamb that they could discard. But in fact, Christianity was not destroyed in Eastern Europe. All the communist regime could do was drive it underground. But it pointed forward to a greater reality as well, which that church and all true churches look forward to. That is that the lamb wins. There's a vision in the Bible that we have here in Revelation of the victorious lamb, the lamb who was slain for sin and yet now reigns on high, the lamb that will conquer all before it. This is what we're looking forward to and Revelation 7, 9 to 10 fills out this vision for us. It fills out how that lamb wins. So just drawing your attention to the outline, we're now getting to just get a better grasp of what God's vision is. And we've had a look, haven't we, at these verse, verses here in Revelation 
but I want to read out again Revelation 7, 9 to 10, which are key verses for today. After this I looked and there before me was a great multitude that no one can count from every nation, tribe, people and language standing before the throne and in front of the Lamb. They were wearing white robes and were holding palm branches in their hands and they cried out in a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. We're seeing here a vision of what heaven is like when it's finally unveiled before our eyes. The vision of what will be. You know, some people are fairly unimpressed with this kind of a vision. They think, surely this will get boring after a little while, doing the same thing over and over. But to help us understand why this is such an exciting vision, let me just share a short illustration. Imagine you're Uh, invited to a birthday party. One of your good friends or close family members are holding a birthday party and they talk it up and they talk about, you know, all the things that are going to be done there. It's going to be a great event and here's the menu and it's this venue and whatever it is that they try and talk it up. But then they say, but I won't be there. Uh, I want you to go, but I won't be there. Now, would you be interested in going to some sort of a birthday party or something like that where the birthday boy or girl wasn't going to be there? (laughs) What a ridiculous thing. Why would you go? Isn't that what a birthday party and a celebration is all about? Well, it's like that in heaven. Heaven is a celebration of God and everything he has done in his lamb, in his Christ. That's what heaven is going to be like. It's going to be a great celebration The pictures that we have in the Bible only give us a sketch of what heaven will be like. But the most important thing to grasp is who will be there. The Lamb will be there on his throne and all who belong to him, all who have been transformed by him and who will adore him forever. That's why we want to be there. It's who will be there. It's not so much the what, as much as the what will be great as well. Now, we have a number of word pictures here, don't we, in this passage. Uh, Lots of things, lots of symbolism attached as well. We read about a crowd, for instance, and uh, a throne, that a crowd is wearing white robes and that there's palm branches. Lots of images, isn't there? And the first word picture I just really want to bring out is this crowd this multitude that no one can count in verse 9. Normally we think the bigger the crowd, the more important the event, don't we? The more important that which is being celebrated. Think about big international events like the Olympics, the World Cup or even Eurovision. That has just taken place. The Eurovision Song Championships. Did you see it on SBS? No. (laughs) Do you know who won? Italy, right. Eurovision uh, was gaining a lot of popularity when we were in Portugal, my wife and I were in Portugal and so we'd have Eurovision parties. You know, Eurovision is all about celebrating the weird and wonderful of Europe and everywhere else and working out who has the most so-called talent. That's what it's all about. That's what gathers the crowd together. But you know, Eurovision doesn't hold a candle to this vision that we see at the end. It doesn't hold a candle to it. When you think about the vision here, it's the most multicultural gathering ever. The biggest crowd that no one can count. There's a picture here of great unity and diversity that we don't see in any events here on earth. It's going to be fantastic. And it's a celebration of the Lamb. Significant that the Lamb is the one that gathers the biggest crowd and he is the most important. The second picture is we see that the crowd are wearing white robes. What's that all about? Well, in Revelation and the Bible, white is the symbol of purity and of conquering through the Lamb. 
sin is defying God, turning away from God, turning away from his laws and that's seen to defile people. That pollutes us. In terms of clothing, the imagery here is it means that we're far from gold with, with guilty stains. And yet the crowd are gathered in white. Why are they gathered in white? And what's this symbolism about? Well, in verse 14 it's explained. Jesus has clothed these people in white. He has removed their guilty stains. They can now stand before the throne. You see, Jesus himself took our pollution, our guilt, our shame and nailed it to the cross for it to be there forever and to never stand against us again. Praise God for this vision that we have, this vision that is guaranteed to all of God's people. It's a mental picture that should drive us as well, shouldn't it? We need to picture ourselves there and to think, how then can we be mobilised for being a part of God's vision to get there. But it does beg the question, doesn't it? How do we get there? How does God achieve his vision? You see, it feels a million miles away, doesn't it? I mean, in between the time that Jesus has risen into heaven and now, there's been all kinds of things. Empires come and go, there's been wars natural disasters, pandemics that seem to go on and on and on. If Jesus is on the heavenly throne, and he is, why doesn't he just do something about all this chaos and all this defiance and the tribulation that we see? I use the word tribulation on purpose here because chapters 6 and 7 flash out the tribulation. The tribulation ends off with the culmination of this vision at the end. So it's very important. Chapter 1 verse 9 uh, talks about the tribulation being a present event, not something that is a future event. A lot of interpreters of Revelation seem to assume that the tribulation is either just before Jesus returns or just after Jesus returns. But if you have a look at Revelation 1 9, John says something very interesting about the tribulation. Now, the NIV doesn't necessarily bring this out because it translates the word tribulation as suffering. But here, chapter 1, verse 9, I'll read it. I, John, that's the writer, your brother and companion, in the suffering, the tribulation and kingdom and patient endurance that are ours in Jesus. And he's talking about being on the Isle of Patmos and so forth. The tribulation for John is a present reality. I think it's far better to see that what's going on in places like chapter 6 and 7 is talking about the present day between the first coming of Jesus and the second coming of Jesus. You know, it's talking about life cycles now over the centuries until Jesus comes back again. So the present day is being fleshed out as we speak The book of Revelation is full of sevens, isn't it? If you've read the book of Revelation, seven is symbolic of God's completed work, God's perfect work. And there's various images of that. Here we have the seven seals in these chapters, but there's also trumpets and bowls, and they're all getting at the one big thing. It's very easy to get lost in the detail in Revelation and to get lost in these dramatic images, but not see the big picture. But because John is very interested in the big picture, he keeps fleshing it out for us again and again for the dummies. What is this picture all about? Well, the sevens are about, one, a world that is lost and is broken and is fallen. Secondly, it's about God gathering a people for himself through the gospel and through those who are willing to proclaim and suffer for the gospel. And thirdly, these pictures are all about the consequences of our choices to believe in Jesus or not are eternal. Three major things that we're meant to be taking away. 
What is this picture of the seven seals all about more specifically? Well, the seven seals show us that God is working out his vision through history. As human beings, history comes to us one moment at a time. We can't know the future. It has to come to us one moment at a time. Unless God reveals it, we cannot know the future, the way that history will unravel like a scroll. Now, John sees the seals, the blobs of wax on these scrolls being broken and history being opened up. He sees what is to come. Look carefully with me at what God is up to in history. Look carefully at about how God is achieving his vision of the end. Now, first up, we see the image of what's commonly called the four horsemen of the apocalypse. And that's all in chapter 6, verses 1 to 8, isn't it? Fairly scary image. Uh, Some people might say you should put a rating on this sermon because here is painted a scary vision of what is happening in the world. We have a white horse and rider that represents conquest, power, and I think by this all sorts of power are, are, um, are meant So, for instance, military power, economic power, people who are gathering power for themselves and using it for themselves. Then we have a fiery red horse. This rider comes to destroy peace on earth. So we see something sequential, people grabbing power and then people destroying peace on earth through that power. And then comes a black horse with this rider, And that signifies poverty and famine that come from war. You see some of the price gouging here going on, that there's terrible prices for a little bit of food and if you couldn't afford that, then you starved. Lastly, a pale, sick-looking horse and that's meant to represent death. Death, the ultimate upshot, of these cycles, these awful cycles being played out. This helps us to gain a bit of perspective on our world, doesn't it? On the one hand, our world is a wonderful place, full of blessing, full of joy. And yet, there's a dark underbelly. It's a lost world and under judgement. And it's forever going going to go through cycles of power grabbing and war and famine and poverty and death until the end. That's the bad news. It will have to go through this. Every century has been like this and the 21st century will be like this as well. But, you know, in this we see God's mercy. It's hard to see on the surface, but there is God's mercy. C.S. Lewis Uh, the great Christian writer, the atheist turned Christian, commented on the four horsemen and he saw the mercy of God in it. He saw that suffering is God's megaphone that leads us to God. So in the suffering of these cycles, we question something is up, something is not quite right and we think, what is God up to and am I in right relationship with God? God is calling out through the horsemen to the world and he's saying that there is a solution that he has for the world in his Christ. The next slide is the fifth seal and that's one more ugly sign of what is going on in the world. The martyrs, those who are killed because they're committed to the word of God and to Jesus. John sees the souls of these martyrs killed. What a terrible injustice it is. And it continues to escalate. So, do you know in the last century there were more martyrs than all the other centuries combined? This continues and it will continue in the 21st century as well. And chapter 6, verse 10, they cry out, How long? How long, O God, will you let this injustice keep going? They rightly cry out for justice. But notice God's mercy here. They are safe under God's altar. 
the symbol of God's presence. And they are dressed in a white robe. But do you know there's bad news because God has planned yet more martyrs, more people who will pay the ultimate price so that the word of God and the testimony of Jesus goes out to an undeserving world. But do you see the mercy of God in that? That yet more people are to come into God's kingdom through all of this suffering and difficulty. With the arrival of the sixth seal, we see that the judgment will indeed come. There will be justice. There is a more final day, a day of wrath, where God will pour out his judgment on all those who continue to defy him. The Old Testament prophets spoke of a day of the Lord, a day when God would act to judge all wickedness and rescue his people from their enemies. We can look at the Old Testament and see various days of the Lord in that sense, but there are only a foretaste of this great day to come, a great day of justice and judgment. There is that one final day. Let's go back to verses 15 to 17, which talks about this general judgment that is to come. Verse 15, Then the kings of the earth, the princes, the generals, the rich, the mighty, and every slave and every free man hid in caves and among the rocks of the mountains. They called to the mountains and the rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of their wrath has come and who can stand? Do you believe in the day of the Lord? Do you believe that this is going to happen? It's going to be an unbearable day for those who are not clothed in the righteousness of Christ. They're going to cry out, may the rocks fall on us. So much will they want to get away from God's wrath poured out at the time. If we believe in this, if this is our vision of the end, it should move us to action. The vision of the end will mobilise us now. Yet there's incredible mercy in this next seal, in the sixth seal. You see, it's a seal that's deliberately delayed. God is giving us time. Time. Time for what? Well, 2 Peter 3, 8 and 9. But do not forget this one thing, dear friends. With the Lord, a day is like a thousand years and a thousand years are like a day. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, he's patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. Why the delay? Well, it's not because the Lord is slow in keeping his promise. In fact, the opposite is at work here. God is deliberately delaying the day because he's kind, because of his kindness. He wants everyone to come to repentance. In his mercy and grace, he is giving time for people to come to repentance. That's what life is all about, friends. It's about knowing God's kindness, which leads us to repentance, both for ourselves and then making it known to others. And this is how we become part of God's vision as well. As we live out, as we enjoy, as we reflect on and as we communicate the kindness of God that leads to repentance. William Booth was the founder of the Salvation Army, a movement that had originally an incredible commitment to sharing the gospel with everybody and also helping those suffering the most. And Booth was profoundly impacted by the visions that he saw in Revelation. And one day as he reflected on this, He had his own vision by which he was reflecting on the times in which he lived in. It was in 1906 and as he was on the train, he looked out and he saw all of the masses of people around him and he saw what was, he called, the most open and shameless rebellion against God without a thought for their eternal welfare. And as he reflected on this, he thought of a vision for his own times He thought of human beings as being caught up in an angry sea 
leading to suffering and death and judgment. But out of the sea he saw a rock of salvation coming out in which many were finding safety. And he saw people crawling to safety and some of those who had crawled to safety helping others to come to the rock of salvation as well. Yet it was remarkable for him that so many people who had found safety on this rock were not at all interested in helping the poor creatures in the sea. They were just getting on with life and their own pleasures. And he asked his generation, and I think it's so up to date for our generation as well, isn't it? That why isn't it that people who have found the rock of salvation are not interested in helping others to come to salvation as well? They should make it their business to get people out of the sea, he said. And it's the same with us as well. Whatever our job, our course of training, our stage of life, we need to make it our business to get people out of the sea. The first challenge will be in our local area, won't it? And in our local commitment to church. You see, things like church, which might be a little bit of a routine thing at times, hearing yet another sermon, being involved in ministries like kids' ministry or small groups, it can all seem a little bit routine, a little bit hard at times to just keep going and be faithful. But be encouraged, as we do this, as we commit to this, eternal destinies are being worked out. And as we have those incidental conversation with mates at school or work or uni, maybe around the water cooler or on Zoom, when we get to what we really think life is all about, eternal destinies are being determined. It's incredibly important, friends. Through all of these things, God is completing his version of eternity. And as we look further afield, as we think about mission and as we think about places even more needy than Sydney, as we think about going ourselves to nations, to tribes, to tongues and as we think about possibly partnering others if we can't go, God is completing his vision of the future He's completing his vision of all peoples gathered around the throne worshipping Jesus. Let me get to European Christian mission and our vision. If our vision is of any validity, of any use, it has to be related to the great vision that we just talked about here. And we firmly believe it does. It does tie into God's vision of the future. Our vision is for the re-evangelisation of Europe. That is, the gospel needs to go back to Europe again. Europe was a centre for world Christianity and it sent out missionaries to the four corners of the earth. But now it's getting to the point where the gospel needs to be taken back to Europe. So you see the statistic here, don't you? Do you know more than 250,000 villages, towns and cities do not have even one Bible-believing church or any known gospel witness in those areas? Europe is quickly becoming a spiritual wasteland. We want the gospel to be retold and re-believed all across Europe. There was a time where we could say that Europe was largely reached for Jesus. Think of the early church, Paul the Apostle and others going and the way the gospel rapidly spread in those times. Or think about the Reformation of the 1500s and how Europe as a continent was set aflame with the good news. And yet the forces of dead religion and materialism and secularism have conspired together so that Europe needs to be re-evangelised. Europe needs more workers. We can't just simply say about Europe that it will look after itself, that because there still exists the established church and the three branches, the main branches of Christianity there, that it will look after itself. Because there's such a low number of Bible believers and Bible believing churches there that effectively cannot reach it for itself. It's reached what the missiologists call 
uh, that critical mass or, or lack of critical mass to be able to reach the continent by itself. It needs extra workers. Will you be a part of sending these workers? That's why we're excited that this church and ECM have sent across the Grocots to Romania. But we want to send so many more. I want to go in detail in just a little moment about ECM in Europe and the work that we're doing and why we're excited about this vision and how you could be a part of it as well. Just got a, a little video to show if we can now. Fifty years ago, 50 years ago, 90% of us went to church. Now, barely 4% follow Jesus Christ. A church is a photo op, a skate park, a pub. I believe in what I've experienced, and I worship what I can see and touch. I'm European. I'm lost. Europe is full of churches, but the churches often are empty. In some ways, Europe has been inoculated against the gospel. Just go to my next slide here, just by way of uh, reinforcing some of the things that were said there in the video. Just the next slide, it's uh, belief in a personal God. Okay. Okay, I think we're missing one. <laughs> All right, um, that, that's probably my fault, I'm sorry. Uh, belief in a personal God has gone right down in the last 30 years. For, in about 1980, a lot of Europeans actually believed in a personal God. And one of the things to show you the decline of Christianity throughout Europe is that figure has gone right down. Now it's barely 10% of Europeans who believe in a personal God. Now, that's a long way from even being able to say that they understand the gospel. They don't even believe in a personal God anymore. That's so 10% of Europeans, only 10% of Europeans, even though there might be a large number that self-identify as Christianity, that's often for cultural reasons. But in terms of believing a personal, in a personal God, that's gone right down in the last 30 years. Ah, oh, here we are. Okay, okay, that's, that's magically... Uh, okay, so let me see if I can go back to... Ah, here we are. Yeah, for some reason the slides just got um, uh, in the wrong order. So if I could just introduce myself a little bit more. So my name's Matt George and I'm married to Louise and I've got a daughter, Annabella, who is 12 and a son who we adopted when we were in Portugal uh, through Bulgaria, long story, uh, who's now seven. Uh, so we've been back, we served in Portugal for 12 years 
uh, doing various things, so church planting, university student ministry, a bit of theological education as well. Uh, now we're back and so we live just around the corner in Croydon and our job is uh, to oversee European Christian Mission to be able to send and support workers uh, into Europe. So Europe, I mean, most people have a fairly glamorous picture of Europe, don't they? The sophisticated Europe, the Europe that we go to to see the wonderful sights and have a great holiday. Very few people dig beneath the surface and think, but what's it like spiritually? You know, there's a lot of architecture out there that indicates a history in Christianity, but what's really going on? Uh, That's what I want to talk to you now about. Um, here's some statistics as well that might indicate something of the need. So you might know the European Union has a union of 28 countries. I think it used to be 29 with Britain, but they've since dropped out. (laughs) England uh, have dropped out, the UK. Um, So now it's 28 countries that have a political and economic union. But it says a lot that the constitution of that European Union makes no mention of Europe's unique Christian heritage. Now that is very odd because the established church and the origins of European culture uh, in Christianity are unmistakable and what has bound them together. And yet for the secularists who wrote the constitution of the European Union, it's not even important to even mention Or did you know that there are more Protestants in Saudi Arabia than there are in Poland? Another one, uh, there are two or three times as many Muslims as evangelicals in Europe. So as we can see here, and in terms of the map here, the greener it is, the more Muslims that there are. So you can see fairly high numbers of Muslim people all across Europe now As an average, Muslims make up 4.9% of Europe's population. Um, This was 2016, so I'd say it's even higher now. But you look at places like France, 8.8% of the population are Muslims. And as we consider our our mission, our ministries in Europe, we're increasingly reaching out to Muslim people. Often Muslim people are the people who are most responsive to our message. We can see something of the needs in Europe um, by this slide here. Evangelicals in Europe, and we're thinking about a population of about 800 million, there's about 7 or 8 million evangelicals, those who would self-identify as Bible believers in Europe. Jeff Harper, who is an Irishman who lectures at Sydney Missionary and Bible, Colleges, Bible College, um, puts the need down to three major things. He says that there's a lack of Bible colleges in Europe compared to Australia. So there's 10 times as many good Bible colleges per head of population uh, in Australia as opposed to Europe. So there's not the same accessibility of uh, theological education, of good Bible education in Europe. The other thing is the number of Bible-believing churches per head of population is a lot less compared to Australia. And also the size of the churches... So whether you're talking about, and there are the full gamut of churches of course in Australia as well, small churches, medium churches and large churches. But what's considered small in Europe and what's considered small here are vastly different. You know, just a handful of believers in Europe is considered a church. (laughs) Uh, And even the larger churches, 100 to 200 people is often considered a large church. So just to give you some idea of the needs that are there at the moment. There's a huge battle in Europe between secularism and the gospel. The secularist, secularism says that Christianity, religion, the gospel, they're all in the one box and they're not needed for life, for community, for society. We don't have to look to religion for any guidance about laws and the way community should operate. So secularism is trying to win the day in Europe. And it's very much secularism versus the gospel. That's what our missionaries are finding. And yet we have that promise, don't we, of the vision of the future, of a great multitude from every nation and tribe and people and language. 
Secularism won't win. Let me read a quote as well because I think the signs of this are apparent to some people, even some people in Europe, uh, those who are in leadership. Um, This one, this quote is from the President of Austria who says this, The advance of secularism in Europe will not lead to a disappearance of religion. There is too big a need for people to explain what life is, where life comes from and where we will go after death. So there are some encouraging signs in Europe. I don't want to paint a completely negative picture. As European Christian Mission, we used to be much more of a physical office. Now we're more of a remote office. So this is us on a Zoom meeting recently. Uh, As you can see, uh, we all have our little corners often uh, in our homes. Occasionally we're all together in the office but not very much now just due to the pandemic times. But we're all working together in Australia in order to send and support workers and we really appreciate your prayers. This is a couple of years old now, this map, but it gives you a little bit of an understanding about where European Christian Mission, as we send people from Australia, are, and then wider European Christian Mission International and where our missionaries are. So the orange is where we've sent missionaries from Australia and New Zealand. So places like Spain and Portugal, Romania with the Grocots, that's where we've sent people from Australia. So there's 10 different countries now with about 25 workers sent from Australia. But European Christian Mission International, that's the green as well, uh, plus the orange, uh, we're in now 25 countries in Europe and with about 200 missionaries. So we would really ask your prayers that we would continue to be able to uh, share the gospel effectively in all of these different nations. So we have the Grocots, Addie and Jennifer, who are there in Romania. So they're doing children's ministry. If you like, our default ministry is church planting. The ministry that we most do is planting churches and developing churches. But as a result of doing that, we realise we need to do other things. So many of our workers, so for instance, Addie and Jennifer, are involved in youth and children's ministry. We have university student ministry, theological education type ministry, working amongst marginalised people groups, various things that we're doing. But all with this effort to reach Europe for Jesus and to develop self-sustaining churches all across Europe. Just briefly introduce as well Samuel and Emily Lower Ferreira. So Samuel was a guy that I was discipling at university when I was doing university ministry in Portugal and he came to Australia to do the ministry training strategy at Wollongong University, then went on to Sydney Missionary Bible College. He's since mentored an Australian girl and they're going back. He has to go back to Portugal with his visa. She's going back with him, being married, uh, and uh, they're raising support at the moment to go to Portugal. Uh, They've been a great encouragement to me. Uh, Samuel, in some ways, is me sending back uh, a missionary to do the work that I was doing, but in a way that would be bigger and better because he's a national. So just very exciting. We're also sending out a couple to Austria. Their names are Ross and Shona McGoffrin. So Ross is at Sydney Missionary Bible College. Shona is a New Zealander. Uh, So we're starting to send a few more New Zealanders as well. We're very excited about that. Um, Ross was working in, uh, in Ireland for a couple of years and so has got some experience in mission work and now with Bible College and other things uh, is much more equipped to be able to go back and to be able to be involved in church planting in Austria. Lastly, just uh, here's me in Krakow, Poland and I'm having a chilli coffee with my friend Alexander or his nickname is Sashko um, and uh, chilli coffee is pretty good. Krakow is a great city to visit in Poland and he's planting a Presbyterian church in Krakow, uh, one of the only Presbyterian churches in the whole of Poland. And it's just been really exciting to get behind him and he's actually asking for Australians to come and join him uh, in this work of church planting. 
So let me just share a couple of prayer points as I close off. If you would like to get involved a little bit more in our vision, uh, then please go to ecmaustralia.org and get involved. There's various ways that you can get involved. Uh, fantastic that you get behind the grow cots, but there's other ways as well that you might be able to help us as we send and support workers into Europe. As I shared just before, there are some disappointments about the last year of work that has been restricted. We would have liked to have done so much more but for the pandemic. But God is really strengthening us in our teamwork as a result of the pandemic. Various things that have actually functioned a lot better now. So we have regular Zoom meetings, Zoom prayer meetings, things like that where the whole of the mission is getting together much more regularly to encourage one another. But we can pray for those who are suffering most with coronavirus in Europe, uh, this current wave. Some are still in lockdown and are feeling a bit down. We're grateful for those who are in the pipeline to be sent out uh, into Europe and uh, we pray for open borders when the time is right to be able to do that effectively. Love prayer as well for my son Calvin. Uh, So we adopted him and he's in year two this year but he suffers due to his traumatic background with reactive attachment disorder and he's often a very big handful and, you know, badly behaved in class. So just uh, pray for him. Um, But praise God, the rest of the family are in a good place in terms of church. We go to Scots Church in the city, a Presbyterian church in the city and have been involved in what was a church plant and now is an established church there. And just generally we ask that you pray for more workers for us. Thank you.